Revelation chapter 12. Let's read the whole chapter, then we'll come back and cover verses 1 through 6. But um, what a chapter, all of them. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon, under her feet and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. He drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Verse 7, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and the angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accuses them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him, praise the Lord, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heaven, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the seal, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And boy, is that a fact today. Verse 13, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and a time and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offsprings who keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Verse 7 says, And a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angel fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angel fought. Beloved, there is a war that is on. There is no doubt. There is no questioning it i think every one of us can acknowledge it and say i know that it's so whether we want to be in it or not it doesn't matter we're in it and as i study this we're not going to do the classical spiritual warfare ephesians 6 and go through these things but there is power in this passage because what we're going to see we're going to see why Middle East is the Middle East, what Israel is and what's going through, why that is what it is. We just read it. It speaks for itself, but we'll talk more about that as we look at these things. But here's what the summation of. There's a war, right? And to understand war, we have to go, what is the object of war? In every war, someone is trying to push promote, enforce an ideology. Or, and they are trying to take possession of a people to make them subservient and make them their own. Or they are just trying to take a territory for their kingdom, their power, and their glory. And here's what's important for us as we read these things. What's the object of the war in heaven. I, what, does, what does war in heaven look like? I don't know. I can ponder. But what I only need to know is, what is the object of the war in heaven? You and me. That's what the war is over. 
And then all of a sudden, when I simply come to that, then all of a sudden, the war that I'm in and the spiritual war around me all of a sudden becomes more clear, more simplified, more reasonable of the war's over me. God's willing to fight for you to the death. There's an evil enemy. He's willing to fight for you to the death. And now we see this war, and God's going to show us things of power in the war as we look at these things, as we open with worship in spirit and truth. We're going to see the war over that territory of Israel and why God is fighting the devil because of what devil wants to do. And I'll just summarize it real clear. The devil sees Israel as a prophetic timepiece. If I can stop Israel, then I can stop God fulfilling the book of Revelation. And secondly, and this is what's for everyone, the devil wants to wipe out linkage, lineage, remembrance of what happened in Israel 2,000 years ago. That he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. That he was willing to lay his life down in this fight for us. Father, I bless you for your word, and I thank you for it. I know it will be hard to do it, uh, the depths that it deserves, but Lord, I pray by spirit and truth that your spirit would come here and speak to all of us and come upon us and have a way with us that what this war is about as we read the news, what this war about as we wake in the morning and go, what in the world is going on in my life, my family, my kids? What is this war about? It's about the object of your affection that you created mankind in your image. And there's a fallen angel, this devil, who can't stand it. And he will not rest fighting against it. And so, Lord... We're in a war, whether we like it or not. We will not escape this war, whether we choose to or not. So, Lord, teach us this war. Teach us how to fight, I pray, in your name. Amen. So, in verse 1, it reads... Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. We're going to see another set of seven, 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 continually through there, not to give a recap on the sevens. Uh, I will probably give a little more on it next week, but we're going to see some key things, people. Uh, we're going to see, well, who is this woman clothed with the sun, the moon, the star? It's a great sign. It's a wonder, meaning it's not literal, that's what he's saying, but it's a type, and therefore it speaks a story in its depth by speaking of the type that it is. Then we're going to see a child, we're going to see a dragon, we're going to see, and God's going to open all these things for us as we study this. But we're going to start with this first one is this sun, moon, star, this woman. Who is she? Who is she? It's amazing to me because this verse here is one of the greatest reasons that people get twisted up and tripped up in the book of Revelation because they can't place who the woman is. And therefore, as we read through this tribulation period of 6 through 19 and the seven-year period, people start going, well, maybe the woman is the church maybe it's israel maybe it's and they fill in they fill in and all these type of things as i say often and i remind myself in expositional constancy as i study the word and i look at first mentions and all these type of things sometimes there's a commentary in a verse and we have dozens upon dozens of old testament references in this book of Revelation. And God gives us a whole commentary in a verse. And he speaks something very deep to us that we just come and we read. And uh, who is this woman? It's Israel. Okay. Why? Why doesn't God just say Israel and make it simple? Why does he say there was this woman clothed in the sun, the moon, and the stars? I'll tell you why. Because there's a commentary in a verse. 
And God wants us to go to the commentary and take not just one verse, take dozens of chapters, even whole books. As we look at Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and these type of things and go, let me unfold a word, a promise, not just for what you see today, but to you personally. And we go back to Genesis 37. Speaking of Joseph, then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. Twelve sons of Jacob, that's Genesis 32, verse 28. Genesis 32, verse 20, And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Back to Genesis 37, verse 10, So he told it to his father, that's Jacob, and his brothers, that's the eleven brothers, and his father rebuked him, saying, What is this dream you have, dream? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? Well, we know the fulfillment of it there in Egypt when God will um, bring the nation, the people, uh, the 70 into Egypt to protect them from a famine that is going to come. And this is what the Lord, he speaks a commentary in a verse. He's not just speaking the woman's Israel. He wants to speak something very specific to us because when we miss it, we totally miss it. And here's what he's speaking. 70, famine in the land. I'm going to bring Israel, Jacob, his whole family into Egypt. And when he took them into Egypt in this famine of land, the 400 years of slavery came, yes, because there arose a king who knew not Joseph. But he brings these 70. And through the hardship of 400 years of slavery, God took these 70 who could have easily been devoured out there on a, their own in the land of Canaan by all the enemies around them. And God took them, put them into Egypt, and yeah, it was a crucible of fire and hardship, and yet God turned them into a steeled nation. And 70 went in, and at least 200 or 2.5 million come out. Because we read 600 men of war when we get into the numbers, a commentary in a, uh, in a, in a verse... Four, 600 men of war, add a wife, add a child, add a grandma, add a grandpa, easy, 2.5 million come out, and they come out of steel to enter this battle and move through this promised land. And interesting enough, where's God taking them? To the promised land of Israel, the very Israel that we see today, the very land and soil that we see here today as we look at these things. And so we see something supernatural. We see something supernatural. A Joseph arises and he protects them. A Moses comes and he delivers them. And then a Joshua, in the commentary in a verse, then a Joshua comes to this nation, the sun, the moon, and the, the stars. And this Joshua takes them into the promise. Joshua means Jesus. You know what we just read? Do you know what we just read? We just read Ezekiel 36 and 37. Of what God did then, he's doing now. And this is the word that God speaks. What I'm here in Revelation 12, what I did then, I'm doing now. And what I did then, I'm doing now, Ezekiel 36, 37. As I said, I will regather the nation of Israel from the four corners of the earth. And I will repopulate the land that was theirs. And I will bring them in to this land. And that's exactly what he's doing today. People enter into what this thing is called replacement theology because they cannot believe that God can do supernatural works. And you know what? Me and you need to be careful. Me and you can come to this place. I know God did it then, but he's not going to do it in my life personally. And God is speaking clearly for what I did then, I can do now. Will you have the faith to say, Lord, I trust you to gather me back, to strengthen me, to give me victory over these enemies around me? Because there's a war. The object of the war is the object of the affection. And the object of the affection is Christ's affection towards you. 
And the devil hates it, what? Our affection towards him. It drives him mad. We're going to talk about him as a worship leader. The affection that we give him just drives him mad. It's like fingernails on that chalkboard that just drives him mad when we worship and we praise him and these things. But God speaks to us, what I did then, I'm doing it now. I'm bringing Israel back into the land. And you just think of the amazing parallelisms of this. When Israel came, manna from heaven, right? Water from a rock. Um, Their first battle against the Amalekites, Exodus 17. It says, but Moses' hand became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Verse 13, so Joshua defeated Amalek, which is a picture of the flesh, uh, biblical typology, and his people with the edge of the sword. What? Where in the world the 600,000 men get swords do you ever think of it where do you get 600,000 swords I don't care if it's just 50,000 swords I don't care if it's just 10,000 swords where in the world did you get swords to fight they surely didn't give you swords when you left Egypt and we are not far from Egypt they got swords however it happened And we'll find out when we get there. I don't think they just poofed like manna from heaven. Maybe Aaron made it after he goes, you know, I'm pretty good at making golden calves. How about if I take a spin at these swords? They might be better for this nation. But in any case, you got to start a warehouse manufacturing production line of swords. And you got these enemies surrounding you. And the point that I make is there's this supernatural Manna from heaven, water from a rock, and swords for war. But the first war, the first battle, we read the Red Sea. God just supernaturally, you don't need a sword. You're outnumbered, destruction's upon you. You got the enemy behind you. You got a sea in front of you. You are on the path to destruction. And God opens the sea. They pass through into deliverance. And then when the enemy comes, the sea falls down upon them and devours them. What did we just read? We just read Ezekiel 38, 39. The Magog invasion says in the time of peace when Israel and the walls are down, whatever that looks like in this high technology days, and they're at peace, Russia, Persia, that's Iran, and um, Turkey, and a handful of others, they're going to come down and descend upon Israel when they're at a defenseless position, and God is just going to supernaturally protect them. And it's interesting because it says in that, And then all of Israel will know that I'm the Lord. We're literally reading. We read of all chapter 12. We'll study this a little more next week and get into those details. But here we see the enemy, the the dragon, he's coming to devour them. And God whisks them away and tucks them away in the wilderness for 1,260 days. Here's what the Lord is speaking. He's tearing down replacement theology. Because the devil wants to destroy the remembrance of Israel. Because the next verse we're going to talk about the child. He wants to destroy any remembrance of who came from that lineage. He wants to destroy that there's a place that God says is the apple of my eye. He wants to destroy a place that is theirs and given to them. And so he wants to do all this for the ultimate reason. And this is the ultimate reason. If I can destroy Israel in the land then I can stop or slow down this prophetic clock. But above all, I want to destroy the remembrance of what happened there 2,000 years ago. The war that was fought in the flesh. So all these spiritual battles in heaven, they play themselves out in the flesh. 
We pray it in heaven, and don't ask me how all of it goes, but what I know is it plays itself out in the flesh, and that's why here we are for spiritual warfare. We're the object of affection, and that's where the, the launching of the, of the volley of Satan's hatred towards us comes here on earth, and he did it with his attack to destroy the child, Jesus Christ. And so I come before I move on and I look at these things. God says, I did it before and I'm doing it right now. Before our very eyes, we're watching a rebirthed Israel. We're watching a supernatural protection, 300 million enemies around them. And the six, seven million people still stand. I don't understand how it can be. I'm watching supernatural things. So you can say their advancement in technology and all these type of things. I still go, these numbers way don't match. And yet here they are supernatural there. And God is saying, I did it before and I'm doing it again. And there's a place that he speaks. And I have another nation. Israel's a specific nation. Apple of my eye to be a light unto the world, to say what I can do uh, for a nation whose God is the Lord. But I have another great nation. It's called my church. And every nation is made up of individuals, and they're a chosen people. They're a royal priesthood. They're a holy nation. And they are mine. And here we see that no man, government, or program can stop what I'm going to do in my church. And Satan has tried to destroy his church over and over and over. Satan has tried to destroy the Christians and the individuals within the church over and over and over. And yet God says, I do something supernatural. And I ask myself, and so I ask you, I know the story of Joseph. I had this dream. God spoke something to me. And I think every one of us in this room, God has spoken something to us. You've given your life to Christ. God has spoken to you. Thou art mine. I called you by name. And he who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. And yet you might be in the middle of your Joseph moment. I was given this dream. Sun, moon, stars, 11 fall, bow down before me. And it will happen. Genesis chapter 50, verse 19. All of Israel comes in, all of Israel. They grow into this mighty nation. And Joseph will say this word in Genesis 50, verse 19. What you have meant for evil, God has meant for good. And I ask myself, and so for us to ponder, Joseph, you said it at the end in Genesis 50. What was your thoughts when you were in the middle of that prison? What was your thought when they threw you the 11 stars into that pit? And then you got yanked out and sold into slavery. What was your thought when you said, I'm going to be faithful to my God no matter what, even when a Potiphar's wife comes? I'm going to be faithful to my God, my master. I believe he's speaking way more. Can I sin against my master Potiphar? Can I sin against my God? And there he is in this prison for this period of time, forgotten. And I say and I wonder, I go, Joseph, did you ever give up on your dream? Did you ever just say, never so, it's not going to be? Well, what we know is, and it will be great conversations with Joseph, I'm sure he had his moments, but I think Joseph knew. I know what God spoke to me. Even the times that I'm struggling with it, I know you spoke to me. And that's my word for you and for I. God has spoken to us. And I know maybe it's a dark time. I know maybe it's not what you thought it would be and whatever your relationship, your personal victory, your, your, your children's relationship and marriages and these type of things. And we can go, I don't understand. Why is my work situation like this? Why is my health situation like this? It can seem so dark. And yet God would say, oh, the enemy, what he meant for evil, I'm going to turn into good. I'm going to do something great and mighty because you are my chosen. You're going to be that sign. Israel is that sign to the whole world. I give a great sign. And if the world would just read the Bible, here's my great sign. Israel. They stand as much as the world sits to attack. And here's my great sign, you. As much as the world, the devil, wants to attack, you still stand. And he brings us this power as we look at these type of things that 
there's a commentary and a verse and here's his verse Israel will stand and so too will you sometimes I preach with such power I'm making a joke of myself I preach with such power you hear me with the enthusiasm and the confidence Israel will not fall I don't care what it looks like and then God speaks to me do you have that same belief about yourself will you at every battle that you face and how many times I come back and in the middle of my battle maybe I should just be quiet maybe I'm not and these type of things and I am always reminded by the Lord I want you to have the same power of making that claim name it claim it yes name and claim this Israel will not fall because I will not stop my work with them and neither will I stop my work with you and here you are and I believe you every last one of you we stand and we work and walk this out together so verse 2 then being with child she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth this plays into verse 4 later but we have to come and say well who is the child and it's important for us to simply here's another great sign who's the child well we know she's Israel so now things start getting easy, right? We've established it's Israel. Isaiah 7, you talk about a great sign. Verse 14, Christmas cards are on their way. It's almost July, right? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16. We talked about this as we studied the temple uh, back in chapter 11. That uh, Those notes are online. I won't... Um, pull those back up to but I'll just hit this one in when the when your days are fulfilled God speaking to David and you rest with your fathers I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chastise him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sun. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul when I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. God makes the promise to David, through you the kingdom will be established. And he's speaking of the forecoming of the Messiah himself to redeem mankind. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob. There we are, back to Israel forever and his kingdom there will be no end matthew 1 1 the book of the genealogies of jesus christ the son of david the son of abraham so we know who verse 2 more so verse 5 is going to speak of and then we come to this verse 3 and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadem in his head. He drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. We need not even have to try to figure out who this uh, dragon is because verse 9 tells us, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So we know it's the devil. We look at these things. We see these things for the clarity. We'll talk more about uh, next week um, because it's kind of a repeat of building on it of um, this, the seven heads, the ten horns, the seven diadems, what are all that mean? We'll talk about that next week in that context, but I want to talk about the war in heaven. So let me talk about the war in heaven. And as we look at these things, this war in heaven, 
God gives us, um, I know you might not fully see that, Lord willing, <laughs> Lord willing, God willing, not next week, the following week, our, we're going to replace this with a 10-foot screen. Before you get too excited, all of that means is I can add more. <laughs> They'll still be the same size. I can just add more. <laughs> but it's in work, praise the Lord. And that will be something for our prophecy update. Uh, you'll actually be able to see what I'm, I'm talking about there. But Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. I'm not going to deep dive those, but I just want to pull them out because I want to make a point about where, what does war in heaven look like? God gives us insight into great power and victory against this enemy. When you start to know your enemy, ask anybody, you know, we, anybody in the military, you give me some type of piece of information about my enemy that I know, then I'll say location or weakness or strength, then I know how to attack and I know how to counter. And here's what the Lord's doing for us. And it's like, I'm going to show you I'm going to give you some insight in the things that you can defeat him with. And that's what I want to focus on. We know it's the devil. I could just move on. But what I'm tying, uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are the two deepest mentions of, of Satan. Isaiah 14 speaks of five I wills. And I love how God comes back and he shuts down and slaps down the devil. And I love it when he does that. Is God comes back in uh, Ezekiel 28 and he speaks of his five I wills. And I think there's a power in there. And just digressing for this moment of there's an I will that Satan comes. I will destroy you. I will cast my my vomit upon you and and tell you what I think of you and Cast these thoughts into you that you're never going to win. You're never going to change. You're never going to see glory in your life. And God comes back, and this is where we come. Well, then I come with my five, five I wills of the Lord, and my five I wills of the Lord is I've called you. I bought you with the precious blood. I will deliver you. I will complete what I started in you. And I just come with, you know, devil, when you come with your I wills that you're going to do to me, I'm going to come with the I wills that God says of me. And it will bring a power and a victory. But here we see his I wills. Oh, how you are fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. And look at him today. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights and the clouds. I will be like the Most High. God's going to say, yet you shall be brought down low to Sheol and the lowest depths of the earth. And here's what I find so powerful as I look at these things. And that Ezekiel 28, God's responding, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take up lamentations for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord, you, and the picture of king of Tyre, it's a picture of the devil. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect beauty. He was the most beautiful creation in heaven. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. And he goes on, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, ox, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emeralds with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the the day you were created. God makes sure he knows he's created. Sometimes I think the devil's been created so long he forgets that he's been created. And that's the theory of evolution. We've been here so long we forget that we're created beings and somehow we think of these other things that will come. But the point that I want to make is Satan was the worship leader of heaven. He was created with this beauty and his very hands and his voice were musical instruments. And this is what I believe the battle is when God created you. When Satan fell, he fell somewhere after creation. We, we know he's here in the garden. Satan fell somewhere after creation and obviously before the fall as he lied. He was already in rebellion when he spoke to Adam and Eve. And here's what I believe. And I think the scriptures weave it together. 
He loved being the worship leader. He loved being the beauty. And he loved all of it. And there was a point that he came in his day that he forgot who the audience of worship was and is. And he started to look at the audience of worship was him. He started thinking the audience of worship was the congregation of angels. That when he worshiped, they looked at him and says, wow, look at your beauty. Oh, your talent. And then starts, I will be like the most high. I will. And all these things start. He forgot who the audience of worship is. The one audience. The only audience. When we come here to worship, it's an audience of one. God is our audience. We are the choir. We have people lead. But we're the choir before the audience of one. Him. Audience is for him. For the, uh, the worship is for his glory. And then this is what I know that Satan came and what was the grinding to him absolutely was when God created me and you in his image, then it was over. Satan can clearly see God's object of affection are these people. And when these people sing, I'm now the replacement. I've been replaced because the ultimate audience of worship these people are worshiping him and that's when he fell and that's when he says this is not going to happen and he turned his wrath again anyone who looks like him but very specifically anyone that worships him in spirit and truth and now we see and now we know war the object of God's affection we wrestle not against flesh and blood but principalities and power and wicked place the warfare is in heaven and there was war broke out in heaven i don't know what all that means but what i do know and what i see is but the determinant is here on the flesh here on this earth is where the battle is finalized and played out because man has a free will and the battle that's on and god has to give you a free will or it's not love And we see this, and Satan comes, and he wants to tear this down. And what's the point that I make? As I said, we learn something, and we learn something powerful. Just a reminder for many, but something new for some. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, the whole chapter, but Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, he's going to war against a multinational front. He's outnumbered. There's no chance of victory. Destruction is, he's doomed. He knows it. And he comes before the Lord, and what do I do? I'm so outnumbered, and and defeat is imminent before me. And it's an amazing thing that God would speak to him. Because today, (laughs) I look at some of you military. Okay, we're we're going into war. And one of you go, get the worship team out. We'd be like, what in the world are you talking? This is what God would speak to Jehovah. Get the worship team out. Verse 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 21, Second Chronicles. And when they had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to the place overlooking the wilderness, they looked towards the multitude and they were dead bodies fallen on the earth no one had escaped what's the story worship goes up jehoshaphat calls the singers the choir they start to worship and the enemies go into utter confusion because the enemies against god's chosen people are demonically inspired and infused the worship comes and causes confusion satan can't mount the direct command they start to turn on one another and utterly destroy one another. Jehoshaphat doesn't even have to draw a sword. Worship defeated the enemy. You want a weapon of war? I don't know about you, but every day, I'll just be honest with you, 
I don't wake up in the morning filled with the Holy Spirit. My wife can tell you. If I don't go and spend time with the Lord and just Psalm 46, verse 10, and be still, it's going to be a bad day because my flesh will go before me. And I sit and I just be still. And there's time. And I said I was at a missions conference this week and just great to hear what all these things. I never, I, one of the pastors, Bobby Hargrove's graves up in Hudson Valley, he was amazing because he said, uh, this was during the, the pastor conference portion of this. Um, front end was missions, back end was pastor conference. And he said, he goes, you know, every Saturday, I literally can just feel like the darkness. Jim Symbol up there, Brooklyn Tabernacle, he says that all the time. Like, you can literally feel the darkness. And I know that on a Saturday as the enemy presses in. But boy, I know that sometimes in the morning. Like, you can literally feel the darkness pressing in. And here's what I know the power is for me every time. And you do too who have experienced it. I'm just going to stop and I'm going to worship. And that worship is like fingernails on a chalkboard. That devil cannot stand it. And what must he do? He must flee. And when we come and we worship the Lord in spirit and truth and we lift up our hearts and we're singing on to him, you know it. When you really enter into it, you can just feel it start to lift. Oh, I'm not saying the day is not going to be filled with its warfare, but there's a continual place, time to come back to worship. Some of it's worship on your phone. Some of it's worship in the, in the car on the radio. I think some of it, some of the sweetest is just, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sing. I'm just going to sing unto the Lord what's coming from my heart. I often find, oh, I got this song on my heart, and then five minutes later, I can't find it. And I said, what's the name of that song again? And I'm just like, you know what, just, Ray, just sing what you know. And it's a sweet melody. I love to sing. I love to drink coffee. I find that most people like to hear me drink coffee more than sing. But I shut that door. And I just worship the Lord and we feel it lifting. And that's the point that I make is we learn something of this enemy. And now we get a piece of how I'm going to defeat him. And I'm going to defeat him through worship because we're going to make God the audience and he can't stand it. Verse 4, his tail drew a third of the stars. That's how influential he is. But uh, don't forget, it's still two against one. It's still two to one. God has the majority to throw them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born well verse four is um what does war in heaven look like well we know and this is where i come i know that the war in heaven looks like something on earth in the flesh because this is where the battle comes down to is I'm going to devour this child, meaning I cannot defeat him in heaven. Therefore, the only way I could possibly destroy God, the God-man, is come and destroy him when he came to this earth. And now we see us stepping right into it, the created in the image of God, man right here on earth. So the same for us. But Matthew 2, verse 16, Jesus is born. Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male child who were in Bethlehem and all the districts from two years old and under, according to the time which had been determined from the wise men then was fulfilled what was spoken by jeremiah the prophet saying a voice was heard in rama lamentations weeping and great mourning rachel weeping for her children refusing to be comforted because they are no more so here we see this the battle here on the earth verse um, five she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. So he tries to destroy, thought he has victory, but we know that was a short-lived victory, and uh, the resurrection power, Satan thought he had one, 
One had one he thought, only to be totally um, beat down by the Lord and shown the resurrection power. But this child who's to rule the nation, we study that in chapter 11, um, but Psalm chapter 2, verse 7 through 9, you shall break them with a rod of iron. Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 through 28, we see ruling with a rod of iron. Revelation 19, 13 through 16, um, the rod of iron again, and we know that he will, as we studied in chapter 11, the kingdoms of God are becoming our Lord. But here's the beauty of the power of this throne of God. Speaking of this war, Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The great victory, he's seated at the throne of grace, that you may find help in your time of need. What is it that you need today? There's a victorious God who cannot be defeated. What I did, I'm doing. And it cannot be stopped. What is your need? There's a God who rules the nation and invites you and me into an intimate time with him. Come boldly. In verse 6, then the woman fled into the wilderness. We'll talk about this next week. It's God's supernatural protection where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. I will cover that in depth next week, come back for that. But again, God makes a statement, 1,260. Not 1,259, not 1,261. The number's the number, and the number is specific because no man, government, or program can stop the work of God. And we can look and go, it's not going to happen. This is not going to come to pass in my life. And yet God says, what I'm doing, what I've done then, I'm doing now. He who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. No man, government, or program can stop the work in your life. And no man, government, or program can stop what God's doing in the nation of Israel. No man. Haman and Esther. Herod. In the time of Jesus, Hitler in our modern era can stop the work of God. No government, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Egypt then, or whether it's Hitler and the Nazi Germany, or whether it's Hamas just months ago, can stop the work of God. And no program. The Auschwitz fires of genocide or Hamas and their terrorism. No man, government, or program can stop the work of God. 1,260 days, I will take them and I will tuck them away and I will preserve them and no devil can come and take them away. And God has a specific number for you. He knows your number and he is protecting your number and no man, government, or program can disrupt that number. But what we come to is this place like a Joseph. We have to come and go, you know what? The promises look dark right now. But by faith, I'm going to believe the dream and the word that you gave me, you're going to fulfill that. In Genesis 50, verse 19, what the enemy, what you meant for evil, God has made for good. And that is what the Lord will do to us. And now we come to worship in spirit and truth. Let's have the worship team come back. However, before we do that, worship team can come back. Do you know Jesus? Anyone here today, anyone on the live stream, do you know that you know that you know that you're his? For he who began a good work, he's going to be faithful to complete it. But what he invites us to is this place of intimacy. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. We're standing here together to say we are all have been there. In Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. But God, Romans 5, 8, demonstrated his love for us that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us.
the one who would come through the lineage of David, through the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He came, and he could not be stopped, and he did what he came to do, and that was to put his life down as a sacrifice that you and I might have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And all that you have to do is if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. And what that we're confessing is we need a Savior. Our sin separated us from the holy God, and yet God traded places and died for us so that we can trade place, become a son and a daughter. If you've never done that, call us. If you've never done that, email us. If you've never done that, come up and speak to us. But it is a decision, and it's a free will decision that you must make. And we can help discuss these things with you over him. So, Father, I bless you. You've overheard because it was your word. And as you spoke your word to us, Lord, we know that it shall not return void. Lord, we come in, we worshiped in the word, in spirit and truth. We believe the spirit of the living God was teaching us and speaking to us what this war looks like and why things are around us the way that they are. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as you said we should. That If there's a peace in Jerusalem, I know there's a peace in the Middle East. And I know, Lord, there's a day where all these things unfold, but you have them, 1,260 days, you'll tuck them away and protect them. And so we know that your word is true. But Lord, this truth that you give us, it's power in our lives. And I thank you for the word that gives us the way to walk. And now, Lord, we come and worship in song. And I know it will send the devil on the flea because he can't stand that we make you the audience of one. We are now the worship leader. He has lost his title and position. You've made your church and every one of us in it the worship pipes that sing praise to you who's worthy to be praised. So would you hear our worship before the heaven above? We love you. We praise you. You are who you say you are, and you do what you say you will do. In your precious name, amen.